Well, in a booklet called uh, The Church Challenged by Current Issues, one writer had something to say about the challenge of personal evangelism. He said, the challenge today for the church to evangelize the world is indeed awesome, but it is no greater a challenge than Jesus gave to the first century disciples. Of a certainty, the world population today is many times that of the first century. But we possess means of communication and transportation which enable us to do more work in less time. Also of a certainty, many people in the world today uh, do not receive, uh, are not receptive to the gospel. So was the case in the first century. I think that's a really good point to remember is, I think we always feel like, um, well, people today just don't want the gospel. As if people 50 years ago didn't want the gospel either, or that there weren't people 200 years ago, and, and that there weren't people 2,000 years ago who didn't want the gospel. Uh, not wanting the gospel really boils down to not wanting to submit to God's authority, and not wanting to submit to God's authority is as old as Genesis chapter 3. He goes on to say, The great challenge today is this, Will each one of us personally be the Lord's faithful servant? So in our lessons so far in personal evangelism, we've kind of seen personal evangelism from a very, very high view. We, we've seen the concepts behind it, uh, some of those kind of top-level ideas. I think the last time we studied, we, we brought it in a little bit closer and got a, a little more practical. And today's lesson is just going to bring it right on home to the question of what can I personally do in personal evangelism, almost like putting the personal back in personal evangelism. So going along with the theme of what this writer is saying as far as the challenge that's presented to us in evangelism, let's ask our first discussion question, what do you think we have going for us in evangelism today? And what I mean by that is stop thinking about all the things we don't have going for us, which Christians tend to focus on that. Oh, with TV these days, people have such a short attention span. And, and with the internet, people are exposed to all these different false doctrines and strange religious ideas. Or, or with the way that people get divorced so frequently now, uh, is that a challenge that we have to face? Uh, we have all these things that we're constantly talking about, like we're a bunch of pessimists, like, like we're, we're those spies that came back from the land of Canaan and said, well, we were like... We were just like grasshoppers in their sight, and all the people of the land were giants to us. Well, stop thinking like that. Do you have some things going for you in personal evangelism? What do you think? Okay, the power of the gospel, Romans 1, verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the power of the gospel because it, or I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation. So, in a sense, let the gospel just be the gospel. You don't have to do all the work. God already did all the work for you. He did all the work in dying for sins. Got that covered. Don't have to worry about that. He did all the work in preparing a message that would, you know, give people access to that salvation. He took care of that already. Even in a sense, the means to preaching, as far as uh, the methods and how you go about preaching, even that is, in a sense, kind of taught through the Word and provided to us. We really... Honestly, it's not like we're inventing something brand new here in evangelism. It's pretty much the same tactics that have been used for a really, really long time. Reaching people's hearts, appealing to people's minds with plain and simple truth. It's old as the hills. Go ahead, Lance. We have rights and liberties in this country that allow yeah. us to not fear our life. That's a good point. If you didn't hear what he said, and I think Brian just went to go get the mic, if you didn't hear what he said, we have rights and liberties in this country uh, that really, in a lot of ways, have been just unseen in human history. We have an incredible advantage in that we live now and where we do. And in a lot of other civilizations, that just has not been the case. I, I think that most people in the first century would have loved to have the opportunities that we do just as far as personal liberty goes. I think people even just 150 or even 100 or even some people even 50 years ago wish that they could have lived now with the personal liberties that we have. And that's important. I can go to any public place and I can legally stand up with the Bible and just start reading. Any public place I can go 
you know, barring any other considerations as far as danger or the particulars of, you know, this or that, that, that law. But in a sense, I can go to any public place and I can just start preaching. And that hasn't been the case in a lot of other societies. That's a really, really great thing to remember. Brian. So I think sometimes we look around at our society and we see the, how sort of maybe annoying it is that people overshare their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, you tweet about everything, you post an, a photo about everything, everybody's posting every five seconds to what, about what they're doing on Facebook. But that's mm -hmm. also more than any other time, you, your, people's lives are an open book to you. Yes. And, that's, and that's more of an opportunity every time they say something about what they're doing or where they're going or what they're thinking about. That's more, every time that's more of an opportunity for you to, to put your foot in the door and say, let's, let's start a conversation about that. Or, yeah. And I'll even add, I'll even add, it's not just that the opportunity to share is there. I think because of the technological environment today, I think people also have a desire to read it. If people didn't want to read Twitter, Twitter wouldn't exist. If people didn't want to read Facebook, Facebook wouldn't exist. If people didn't want to read blogs, then blogs wouldn't exist. I mean, the very fact that these opportunities are there for us to share means that somebody out there is, is reading it. And I think we live in a time really unprecedented perhaps in American culture, but we live in a time where people care about learning about other people. Like, we want to know, like, oh, how old is your baby? Everywhere I go, I take my kids to the mall, I take them to the zoo, I take them, how old are your kids? Oh, what are their names? Like, people want to know. They want to know personal information about you. And I don't think it's a bad thing. I think people just, I don't know what it is about our culture, but I think we want to know. And so that's a very good point, Brian. John, I add to that? I have a golden opportunity every day. I do a customer service thing. I'll meet two or three different new people. Mm -hmm. But the problem is the company I work for is a Mormon company. Okay. And I'm on the east side, and if I go into a person's house, if they're Mormon, they'll usually have a, a picture up of the temple or something. I know yeah. they're Mormon. But when I find out they're not Mormon, I'll give them a card. But our main customer is Mr. Fulton, Fulton Holmes, which is Mormon. Yeah. So I'm walking on thin ice when, when I go to say anything. Somebody but, you know, one thing to add to that is, is even in an environment like that, the very fact that you're different creates an opportunity. Uh, I had somebody come into our home. Uh, he, he was installing uh, cable TV uh, and this is just a month or two ago. And uh, he, he came in and uh, he obviously does a lot of work in Gilbert. That's his, his area. And, and for some reason or another, I don't remember how we got on the topic, but he made some kind of comment that led me to believe he was not Mormon. And I, you know, I don't know. In Gilbert, I assume that you're Mormon unless you tell me otherwise. But he made some kind of comment that indicated that he was not Mormon, but he was, uh, you know, of a Christian religious background. And so we got to talking about it. And, and he actually was telling me that, you know, I'm really shocked that you're, you're a Christian minister, you're non-denominational, and you're out here in Mormon country in Gilbert. And that gave us an opportunity to, to talk about religion simply because I was just different from those around me. And so even being kind of the oddball at work kind of gives you an opportunity Gary, and then Jesse, did you want to add something to that also? We'll get the mic back to you here in just a second. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, just one thing I wanted to add before we moved on from this topic. Uh, we talk about how the technologies of today kind of pull people away from God, but at the same yeah. time, it can be useful for us. And this congregation yeah. has done well with uh, the CDs and the DVDs. Uh, and, you know, just the recent years, a kid made a series of lessons based on the different religions and how they compare to the Church of Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got those out throughout the whole country, some even in Canada, I think. And I'm convinced those are still out there teaching. Yeah. You know, yeah, you, a yeah. lot of hard work that you and, and Alan does and Ken, those lessons are, are living for quite a while. Yeah. You know, and that's awesome. They didn't and, have that in the first century. And that's not even, you know, we've even moved past, the, the new generation is even past the DVD generation. We're, we're a post-DVD generation. And so even beyond that, now we've got 
the internet. We've got YouTube, and so you don't even have to get a DVD. You don't even have to have a DVD player. You can just look right on your smartphone, and, and in, in two seconds, you're watching a sermon from Alan. In two seconds, you can. Go ahead. So um, what I wanted to add was, along with technology, we have the advancement and the opportunities to learn for ourselves, where yes. 50 to 100 years ago, we were very limited in our uh, texts, information, and what we could learn. So we can not only read the Bible, but we can go back and learn the Greek and the mm -hmm. Hebrew and actually dig a little deeper than most times past. That's a great point. And a lot of those tools are made very accessible now. You know, they're searchable, they're downloadable, they're, they're things that even a, a you know, I ter use the term tongue in cheek, but even a lay person can hop on and, and use those kinds of tools. And also, our culture uh, prides itself on, on education and, and personal self determination that if you want to learn something, go out and learn it. If you want to do something, hey, go to a community college. You, you, want to learn, you want to learn how to do computers? You want to learn how to bake? You, know, you, you want to learn something about dinosaurs? You want, if you want to learn it, go learn it. And, and, our, and our culture encourages that. And I think that's true of religion as well. You can compare different things. You can, you can read different texts. You can read debates. You, can, you have access to information. This is all really, really good stuff. Let me give you a couple here. Uh, maybe some more things that are, are perhaps a little... Uh, more generally speaking, we have truth. We should never forget that. Uh, what the world offers in place of truth is just the cheap knockoff. You know, what the world offers is entertainment, and what the world offers is money. What the world offers is a sense of materialism. What the world offers is social belonging. You know, the world offers kind of these cheap knockoffs. When you go to somebody and say, and this is truth, thy word is truth. Uh, they'll know the truth, and the truth shall set them free. I, th those kinds of statements really stand out. Remember at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, the last couple verses there, after Jesus finishes speaking, what was it that impressed the, his listeners so much about Jesus? Yeah, he spoke as one having authority. Jesus walked into every room and every hillside where he preached, and he walked in that room because he had truth. And he, he walked in knowing he had truth and he presented it as truth. And people were just shocked by that. They were shocked. This is a guy, he speaks with authority. Th this is not opinions. This is, this is not guesswork. This guy speaks with authority. And I think that's a really valuable, valuable thing. Remember, we have each other. We have each other. And I don't want to talk compare church to church to church or whatever. I know there are bigger churches than Monta Vista, but there's a whole lot of smaller churches than Monta Vista also. And we're really fortunate that we get to have 177, and not everybody's here. We were missing this morning. We could have had 182 if we were here. We're very fortunate that we have the body of believers that we do at Monta Vista. And just remember that. Maybe we don't have five or 10,000 people or whatever, but let's remember, we've got a really great resource just in each other in each other. I think that's extremely valuable. So let's consider a couple things then as a segue, conveniently enough, to the next section of our, of our lesson, which is on how it takes a church. You know the old adage about raising children. It takes a village to raise a child. And I think that's also true in personal evangelism. It takes a church to do personal evangelism. A preacher, and I touched on a little bit last week, but I want to dig in a little bit deeper into this concept now. A preacher can do only so much work. And if you've got a really great preacher, and Alan is awesome, but if you've got a really, really great preacher, you can, you can get so far. One really good preacher can get a church, you know, so far. And he can put his heart and soul into it, and, and you'll get some conversions because that's what preachers do, is that's what we're supposed to do, is we're changing hearts and minds to the preaching of the gospel. But imagine what it would be like if you had a really great preacher, but you also had 200 members who were each contributing their fair share of the work as well. Suddenly it goes from the preacher, well, I mean, like I said last week, how many contacts do I make in the community? A few, at best. 
Uh, I get people who knock on the door asking for handouts. That's a few contacts. I, I see someone at the bank when I go deposit a check or whatever. Uh, someone, you know, someone who's at the, at the grocery store, the checkout line. But that's it. I, I don't make a whole lot of contacts because I just, I don't have a secular job. I don't have access to it. But what if I had 200 other people? Just imagine, what if? What if you had a preacher who had 200 other people who were feeding him opportunities as far as Bible classes go and involvement and, and support uh, places to host Bible classes, uh, giving good ideas for Bible classes. Imagine what it would be like if you had 200 other people who were kind of throwing their own effort into the work. How many people would get changed then? How many more opportunities would there be for Bible studies and, I think, naturally speaking, people being converted to Christ as well. Barry Kirchival said something, and you should know that Barry Kirchival is, is someone who is a real, I would call him an expert. I, I would not use that term lightly, but Barry Kirchival is an expert on personal evangelism. And he's written a lot on the subject. And in Focus Magazine from a few years ago, Barry Kirchival had this to say of a church working together. He said, when I speak of sa saving a soul, he says with quotation marks, I'm referring to a process that begins with the initial contact with an unbeliever and does not stop until years after the baptism into Christ. Many Christians only see the baptism. They're unaware of the time and the effort that's spent patiently instructing, discussing, encouraging, and persuading. Further, Christians who are not involved in this process don't realize how difficult it is for a new convert to exchange their old carnal friends for new spiritual relationships. Most have forgotten the tough changes that must be made and the help needed for a new Christian to go from sin to righteousness. You know, we read about that change in Ephesians chapter 4 of going from the old man to the new man, from the life in the flesh to the life in Christ. And if it's been a while since you made that change, Maybe you've forgotten just how hard it was. Or if the change for you personally was not a real big struggle, you didn't have addictions or you didn't have a lot of friends who pulled you the wrong way, maybe, maybe, maybe it wasn't as challenging for you in a physical sense to become the new person in Christ. Maybe you don't realize that a lot of the people that we work with in our Bible classes have a real struggle. Not just with the things that they're facing, but also socially speaking as well. Is, is it hard to come to a group of 200 people and they're all strangers and, and, and they all look so nice like they've got their lives all put together and then you come in and it's, you know, you feel like you're the only one in the room who isn't? That's a challenge. And I love the way that Barry puts it there is it takes an entire congregation. It's not just about baptizing people. It's about baptizing people and teaching people how to be a part of the body of Christ integrating people into the body of Christ so that they not just have a place with Christ spiritually, but they have a place with Christ's people in this world as well. When we take a deeper look at saving souls, we realize just how important every single one of us is in the process. Uh, let's think about some practical applications here. Saving people takes the cooperation of an entire church. I get a uh, a few passages here that I want to just note here in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 14. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 14, we urge you, brethren, is brethren a plural or a singular? Plural. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all men. Now, maybe it doesn't say teach anywhere in there, but is all of this part of that process of teaching? Is all of this part of the process of growing people up in Christ? And he doesn't say, I urge you, preachers, make sure that you do all this. I urge you, brethren, plural. I urge all of you to play a part, to, to have a hand in the process of admonishing, of encouraging, of helping, and of being patient with people as they go through that process. I really like that verse. Uh, not only does a successful conversion require a teacher, but it also requires a social network of warm, kind church members to make that new person feel at home. Barry Kirchival, the same one we quoted earlier, um, 
Now, now he obviously does not have any kind of decades-long study to back this up, but he, he admits, purely anecdotal, purely anecdotal, if he said that if, if a new convert doesn't make six friends in six months, you're going to lose them. See what I mean there? If you convert somebody to Jesus Christ, they become a Christian, if they don't make six good friends in a congregation in six months, the likelihood of them sticking around is just going to drop off precipitously and you're almost definitely going to lose them. And that has nothing to do with teaching. That has everything to do with welcoming people into your homes, being hospitable, being caring, looking out for people when they have a physical need, showing people that you care that they're here and that we're not all just sitting in our assigned seats looking forward, hoping that we don't make any more contacts. That's, I think, a really just important, just again, purely anecdotally, but six friends in six months, or you're probably going to lose that person. I think that has always stuck with me, the way that he put that. Uh, some things to consider. We need hosts for Bible studies. You might not be able to teach a class, and that's fine. If teaching is not your thing, then that's okay. What does James 3, verse 1 say about teachers? You're held to a higher standard, so... Not all of you should be teachers. And I like the way he puts it. It's just plain and simple. If that's not your thing, that's not your gift or your talent, just understand, you're going to be held to a higher standard, so not all of you ought to be teachers. Quite frankly, I ought not operate heavy machinery. Let's just be honest about this. I'm probably more comfortable in a Honda Civic than I would be in a Caterpillar. I ought not operate heavy machinery. That's not my thing. Now somebody out there might be trained and certified to operate heavy machinery. That's his, yeah, that's right. Christian, that's what you do. That's what, that's, but that's kind of understanding is, if it's not your wheelhouse, you're not expected to teach in a literal sense. Sit down, open up the Bible and say, okay, lesson number one in our evangelism class here, that might not be what you do, but can you provide a home for it? Sometimes I make contacts that are in, in far-flung parts of town. I might have a contact in Scottsdale. I might have a con I mean, what if I had a contact all the way up in Paradise Valley? What if I made a contact in Levine? Uh, and we've got church members spread out all over this valley, don't we? We've got people all the way from this end to that end and everywhere in between. And what if I was to call you and say, listen, I've got, I've got someone who's interested in a Bible study, but he's all the way up there. Uh, can, can we just use your living room? Can we come on over and use your living room sometime? Uh, you know, Thursday night, 7 o'clock, can we pop in there and just have a Bible study? Maybe you can sit in and, and read some verses for me. I mean, simple things like that. That's a simple, material, tangible way that you can help in the studying. There's no need for class, uh, excuse me, there's a need for class assistance also. Uh, I, sometimes I like to have someone else with me. I mean, I like to be alone every now and then when I'm studying with somebody, but it is nice to have a second person in there just to, to read verses or say a prayer or maybe kind of bounce an idea off or make a comment every now and then. It takes a little bit of that pressure off in a Bible study, just having someone there every now and then. When Jesus sent his disciples out on a limited commission, what numerical value did he send them out? Two by two, yeah. He sent them out in twos, and I think there's a lot of value there. Whenever Paul went on his missionary journeys, he typically did not go by himself. He went with Barnabas, he went with Silas, he went with Timothy. He would typically bring somebody with him. If you have the ability to teach, then my question would be, why aren't you? Why aren't you? Now, I don't, I don't think that we struggle every quarter, but I don't think that Dale would get upset if he had too many teachers for our Bible classes. But let's go beyond that. Not just Bible classes in the building, which are important, and we could always use more volunteers for that. But you know what? If you know the Bible, if you've been a Christian for 25 or 30 years and you know your Bible really well, I, honestly, I'm asking, why aren't you having that Bible study with that neighbor who you always like to talk to? Why aren't you inviting someone to just sit down with you after work sometime and just say, hey, let me show you some things out of the Bible. You know, are you curious? Would you like to sit down and have a Bible study? Maybe you're scared. We'll talk about that next week because next week's class is on the excuses that we make of why we don't do more personal evangelism. But just, just think about that. Think about what excuses are you making of why you aren't teaching classes, having a study with somebody. 
Uh, even Paul didn't do all of the personal evangelism. In fact, most of his work was strengthening churches that were already there. In Acts chapter 19, were there already disciples in Ephesus when Paul showed up? Yeah, there were. Now, did he have to do a little bit of uh, work with them to make sure they understood some things correctly about the Holy Spirit and John the Baptist and baptism? Sure. Th there was some work that he had to do to make sure they were clear about some truths. But when he went to Ephesus, were there already disciples? When he showed up in Rome at the end of the book of Acts, he finally gets to Rome, shipwrecked and has all this trouble. He finally gets to Rome. Does he find Christians there? There's already people in these communities. There's already people in all these communities. Acts chapter 14, verse 22. Acts chapter 16 and verse 5. Even in the Corinthian example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I like the way he points out in verses 14 through 17. He says, I didn't baptize hardly any of you. I wasn't the one doing all the conversions. I'm not the one doing all the baptisms here. And I think that's a really good thing to remember is... Uh, and I love it, by the way. I love to see other people baptizing. I, I love it. I love it that it's not just me, because I'm not. I'm not clergy. I'm not the pastor. I'm not the father. I, I'm not the. You know, I'm just one of you. I, I'm just a Christian, just doing the best I can with the talents that I have. And I love it when I find out after the fact. Don't ever. Don't ever think I'm going to be offended. <laughs> you know, if so, if you call me, hey, I baptized somebody last night at the church building. Well, great. <laughs> I'm fine with that. That's cool with me. I like to be invited. You know, if you want me to come, I'm happy to come. But I think it's just important to realize it takes a church, and even Paul the Apostle wasn't out there just carrying this, like with this Herculean effort. He was not out there carrying the burden. And I honestly think the reason why many churches don't ever end up growing is just because members are not getting on board with personal evangelism. A uh, personal anecdote, when Ryan Joy was interviewing with a couple different churches about where he might want to go uh, preach. He, you know, he came back with some interesting stories about the questions that they had for him. You know, all these churches would talk the talk on personal evangelism. They, oh, we're, we're big into personal evangelism. We have personal evangelism is really important to us. And I remember Ryan would tell me, okay, well, what are you guys doing then? You know, what, what's the congregation's side of that? And no one ever had an answer. <laughs> Another preacher friend of mine did the exact same thing. Just a, a month ago, he went to interview for a church in California, and they were all high on a van. We want to grow. We want to see people baptized. And, and, and uh, what, what are you going to do? And the whole congregation, he said, just was crickets. And, and nobody had any comment on, well, what's our side of this? You know, honestly, that's why a lot of churches don't ever end up growing. It's not location. Okay? It, it's not how comfortable your seats are. Uh, it, it's not does the preacher wear a nice tie every Sunday. It's nice if he does. But that's not what it is. It is a group of people working together for the cause of Christ. Everybody's doing their part. Which again is a segue into our next point. Go ahead, Lance. You, you can go fishing all day, but if you don't put bait in the water. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and I don't know, I don't want to stretch the analogy too far, but just kind of imagine what it was like if, if, if you rented a fishing trolley or something like that. You know, you're a trolley. You, you know, you go out there, uh, you, you've rented a, a boat for a day, and, and it comes with a captain, you know. <laughs> the boat comes with a captain. And uh, he's out there doing all the fishing, and what are you doing? You're sitting on the deck just uh, watching him do all the work. Well, what if we load that boat down with 200 people, and you just have one guy out there, and he's the only one doing anything? He's never going to catch enough fish for everybody. It's a good, good analogy. The actual biblical example is you're not going to grow anything if you don't plant your seed. Yeah, and that's the parable. Yeah, the parable of the sower. Yeah, that's a good point. And I like always the parable of the sower. That's a good one on personal evangelism, among any, many other things. The fact that he threw the seed out to all different kinds of soils. Um, good point. I like that. Lost your mic, bro. I did? Battery down. Battery down. Yeah, it's fading. No! I don't like being behind the big thing. Okay, I'll just go over here. Anyway, 
you can edit this part out. Oh. Okay. You know, that fishing analogy wasn't very good anyway. Just, Brian, cut that part out. I, I could have come up with a better analogy if I had 30 more seconds. A, a, a donut shop analogy was floating around in there somewhere, but it just wasn't articulating. All right, and go. Let's uh, turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. I don't want to notice a verse here in Ephesians 4 and verse 16. And I know we're cutting in the middle of a sentence here, but I want to focus on a, a phrase that he uses here, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Ooh, you know, that, that's a whole sermon right there, isn't it? That is a whole sermon. Each of these phrases tells us something about the proper working of individual parts. I like this. Every joint supplies something, first of all. Everything is fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies. So a church is fully functioning because everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. Not what someone else is supposed to be doing, not stepping on somebody else's toes, not, not doing the ministry that, that's given to somebody else, but the work, the ministry, the talent that is yours according to the proper working of each individual part. This is an important point to remember also. Proper working of each individual part. Now, can you force sometimes a tool to do what it's not meant to do? Yes. Everybody's done the home improvement project. I'm guilty of it. Everybody's done the home improvement project where you're in the middle of something and you're holding this thing up and you're pushing this thing and, and there's a tool right here, but the right tool is in the garage. And you go, so far away. yeah, so far away. And you go, I, I can make it work. And you kind of jam it in there, and then you break the tip of it off or something like that. Okay, we're all meant to do something. Now, I don't want you to think of that in any kind of weird predestination way. Don't, that's not what I'm saying. You're meant to do something. You are you, and you are exactly, with the set of skills that you have, what God wants you to be. Now, there's nothing wrong with learning new skills. I think it's great when Christians stretch themselves out, try something new, to see if maybe that's a skill that's been heretofore hidden in themselves. But you are what you are. Don't try to fit the, the, the square peg into the round hole. And I think that's important to realize. You don't have to be a teacher to practice personal evangelism. You have a proper working. You are meant to do something as an individual in the body. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, Austin led the song number 504 this morning, I Want to Be a Worker. And the first verse says, I want to be a worker for the Lord. I want to love and trust His holy word. I want to sing and pray and be busy every day. Mm -hmm. And unless all of us skipped singing verse 1 of that song, I think we all just committed ourselves to saying that I want to be busy every day. Yeah. And I don't, you know, unless, hopefully we all really meant that. And... You know, that seems to be, to me, it's not just I want to be busy on Sunday and I want to be busy on Wednesday. It's I want to be busy every day. And it's the yeah. desire, it's that wanting to be busy, it's that wanting to be a worker, it's wanting to do something. And if you want to do something, then it doesn't really matter necessarily what that role is, so long as you're as doing... As long as it's defined by God. Right, yeah. and, and so long as you're doing, so long as you have that desire, you know, then you will figure out what your role is, what your, what your place is yeah. in the work. But you got to want to work first, I guess is really yeah, the point. Yeah, we, we all know the analogy in 1 Corinthians 12 that Paul uses. He says that, you know, it, the church is like a body. And every part has its own function. Every part has a function that is just as important as everything else. And if you're a foot, be happy being a foot. Don't be envious of the head. If you're the head, don't look down at the foot and think of it as anything less than what it is. Because after all, you know, where would the head be without the foot? Uh, where would any part of the body be without every other part of the body? And when we're all working together, some people are teaching, some people are inviting, some people are making contacts in the community, some people are preparing 
Bible class material like the McSpaddens. I mean, you're all taking advantage of the personal evangelism workbooks that they put together. Everybody's doing something. Some people are hosting Bible studies. Some people are just encouraging the preachers. And I think that's, that's an important part also when you're praying for the preachers. I might not always know it, but I guarantee you, if you're praying for Alan and if you're praying for me and if you're praying for our elders, you're doing something. And that's an important part. That is a really important thing. I'd say all of us should be doing that properly. But everybody's got something to do that God defines. And I think that's important to remember that, you know, my, my talent is not going to be basket weaving. <laughs> my talent has to be something within the, the confines and structure of God's Word. And I'm not just going to serve, well, I don't, I feel like serving God. I, I feel like serving God by painting toenails. That's not necessarily it. You have to work within the structure of what God defines is His work. So that's an important point to remember. So what can I do? A couple of things here. What can I do with our last few minutes? I can love the lost. This is the bottom of page 19. I can love the lost. And that's a huge thing. You might not think it's that big of a deal. Well, what can that accomplish? Loving the lost? If you don't love the lost, I promise you, you're not going to be a very effective personal worker. You're not going to get very much done. If you don't love people, if you don't care about people, and you know what? Most people are pretty savvy when you're not being genuine. When you're not, when you're not being genuine, when you don't actually care, when you're going through the motions, you pull, out, you pull out some Bible class workbook and you go, okay, all right, lesson number one. Now, let's see. I've got some fill-in-the-blank questions here for you. Oh, has it been a half an hour yet? Ooh, these are long classes, aren't they? People can tell when you don't really care about them. People can also tell when you really, really care about them. When you are willing to show up, when you are willing to help them, uh, when you are willing to go the distance and not let people get away, uh, when you're the one doing the pursuing in evangelism, people can tell when your heart is in it. I think that's a, an important point. So I can love the lost. That's one thing I can do. Don't forget that here, page 20, don't forget that Christianity is for everybody, regardless of a person's sinful background. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10 gives some pretty uh, horrible backgrounds. But in verse 11 it says, You were washed and you were sanctified and you were justified uh, by God's power. It's not up to you to decide how a person will act after being converted. We sometimes dismiss somebody because of their past misdeeds without realizing that it is the worst of sinners who often come to God with the deepest humility. And I'll put it another way, maybe in, in some more uh, practical terms, sometimes it's the worst sinners who end up becoming the best Christians. And it's the people like the Pharisees who in John chapter 9 said, well, we're not blind, are we? And Jesus actually said, in a sense, you're the most blind of all. I think we need to remember that Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, who did, who did Paul think was the worst sinner ever? Himself. I'm the greatest of all sinners. Or I should say, greatest of all sinners. He didn't think he was the worst sinner. He thought he was the best sinner <laughs> in that way. I'm, I'm the greatest of all sinners, but Christ showed in me as the greatest how great he really is. God's grace shines the brightest in, in the darkest places, the darkest corners of humanity. And we need to be really careful not to be respecter of people. That we don't show preference for one class of people over another class of people. But in our evangelism, we need to show that we love the lost no matter what form the lost come in. You don't necessarily have to like everybody, though. And I think that's one thing to remember in personal evangelism. It's not like everybody who's converted is going to become your best friend. Okay, I, I, I you know... Sometimes you just you don't have anything in common with somebody. You're not going to sit down and, and watch a football game with someone who doesn't like football. Uh, you're not going to go to an art gallery with someone who hates art. We have different interests, socially speaking, hobby speaking. So just because somebody's converted, that doesn't mean that you have to just jump on board and just say, oh, well, let's go to a Diamondbacks game together. That's not necessarily required of us as Christians, but I think we have to understand the huge difference between love and love is, I'm going to take care of somebody and show them I care, even if I don't necessarily have a, a social connection to them. Liking somebody does not require love. You can like people all day long. Oh, he's a real nice guy. But you might not have 
that real agape, unselfish love for that person. What we're looking for is unselfish love, not just friendly affection between people. Try to keep in mind that even the worst sinners of the world were also once innocent little children. We forget about that sometimes. We look at the mess that people make of their lives and, in that, and that's all we see, but we forget that at some point that person was, that person was a little two-year-old kid. As sweet and as, in, as innocent as anything. We need, to, we need to remember that when we convert people to Christ, Christ has the power to bring people back to that state of innocence. To, to you know, to, to, to go back, to, to get around that life of sin and get people back to where they were. Uh, last point here. I can have a positive attitude about the success of the gospel. This is page 21. This goes back to what we said at the beginning. We tend to look so much at the pessimistic side of things. How I could give, I could give a hundred invitations out there and how many Bible studies or visits at worship service do you think you're going to get out of a hundred? Probably one. I could knock on a hundred doors in our neighborhood here and I might get one person who will give me five minutes to talk about the gospel. Instead of looking at that pessimistically, you know what I could say is, out of a hundred people who don't care about God, I found somebody who does. When you're cracking those oysters open, you're looking for pearls, right? You might crack a hundred uh, crack a hundred oysters open, and you don't sit there and look at the pile of the hundred oyster shells and go, Ugh, no pearls. What do you do when you find that one pearl? You go, oh, it's all worth it. To find that one pearl, it was all worth it. It was all worth it. And I think we need to be more just optimistic to say, I found a precious soul. Out of a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand or four and a half million people, I found a nugget of gold. Somebody who wants to know God. And if that doesn't thrill you, I, I don't know what possibly could thrill you. But be patient. Be patient with people. We need to remember that people take time to learn. People take time to grow. Some people are converted in the same hour of the night. Some people take a lot longer than that. And we need to be patient and not give up on folks. Brian? Maybe it comes back to the comment I made a couple weeks ago. But, you know, again, it, it, it kind of de depends on how you define failure. Yeah. You know, the 99 oysters that are laying on the table don't necessarily represent failure if, if each one of those was a seed planted. It's true. I mean, it, sure, you know, something might never have come from that, but your job was still completed. Your task was still, yeah. was still completed at that point that you opened up and mentioned the gospel to somebody or told somebody about Jesus or, you know, even if they didn't, represent themselves at the time as being someone who is seeking doesn't necessarily mean that you're not doing your job or that seed might not take root yeah. sometime later. Yeah, and it's just important to remember that without, you know, going back to the, these oyster shells, I mean, you never do find the pearl if you don't start shucking. You'll never find the pearl. Uh, and it, it would be easier to just consolidate to look at a lost world and say, they're so different. People's priorities are so different. They're so fleshly minded. They're so sinful. People, people are just so, they're so dirty in their thinking. Wouldn't it just be easier if we could just, I made a joke about this what, a year ago or so in another sermon. Wouldn't it just be easier if we could just take all the Christians and just live out in like a little commune out in the wilderness. And, and, and Jason can provide all the beef you know, and, and, and we could just have like a little commune. Everybody would be nice to each other. Wouldn't that be easy? Yeah, but that's not what Christ asks us to do. Christ asks us to go into all the world. He asks us to go and do it. And it might take effort. It might take work. And you might personally have to leave your comfort zone just a bit to do it. But when you do find that pearl, it is totally worth it. Every single time. Thanks for your comments this evening. Next week, we're going to be uh, studying uh, in a lesson called Excuses.
And I'll leave you in suspense as to what that could possibly entail. 